Well, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study. I'm excited uh, for us as we're actually coming to a close at the, of uh, the study here in 2 Corinthians, the second letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians as, as we have it in Scripture here. And so uh, it's been good to walk through this. It's been actually 13 chapters and we've walked through it, uh, you know, not... Uh, exactly word for word and verse by verse, but we walk through pieces of each chapter in the past 14 weeks. And so, hope has been helpful and encouraging and enlightening, and we've tried our best uh, to model. Uh, it's important when we try to apply Scripture to our own lives and look for, for those uh, applications to to you don't blindly take things word for word before you first have to understand the context. And uh, this is a very unique letter and how it's, it's written, you know, with a church that was in a bit of turmoil with one another, with uh, the Apostle Paul himself. And ultimately they were uh, struggling in their spiritual relationship with the Lord because they were acting sinfully in how they had attacked Paul and were kind of divisive with one another. And all this was because they were following some bad teaching of what is referred to in this letter as the super apostles or those apostles, uh, the ones that called themselves apostles that came in behind Paul and his companions and said that uh, Paul was an unworthy uh, apostle himself. And... Uh, and we just know that that's not the case. And so Paul really has to come in and, and defend himself. So anyway, in this, um, in this section, chapter 13, we're going to look at verses uh, 1 through 11. But so just prior to this, at the end of chapter 12, Paul had let them know in chapter 12, verse 14, that he was going to come to them for the third time. Uh, and that he was a little anxious, in fact a bit fearful, that uh, their, what their moral and spiritual condition was going to be like when he got there. Uh, but he does not hesitate, as you'll see. And it can look kind of rough here, but, but you have to get to the heart of Paul and the seriousness of, of what's going on to really be able to, to accept this, that he doesn't hesitate in letting them know that he will deal with them severely as the Lord will have him to. Not that he wants to, but he will do as the what is honoring to God and what's honoring to God's church. That was the first and, and most important thing. So in addition to that, he, he's wanting to clear up their rub with him because they, he wouldn't accept uh, support for him as, as he worked among them. Uh, he, he accepted, he wanted to be seen as an apostle who come in as a servant, uh, not peddling the good news of Christ, but, but by offering it free of charge and he would work hard for his way and let other churches help support him while he was ministering to them as an evangelist. So um, the, the apostle, he's wanting a, a full reconciliation with the congregations here in Corinth and he wants them to remove any obstacles that would keep them from being restored to one another when he gets there ahead of time. And so, um, Dr. Witherington, he writes about Paul in his straightforward style. He says, the greatest asset of Paul is his genuineness as an apostle and the authenticity of his ministry. So with all that, let's read these first uh, couple verses here. In chapter 13, 2 Corinthians, hope you're there with me. This is the third time I'm coming to you. Any charge must be, uh, must be sustained by the evidence of two or three witnesses. I warn those who sinned previously and all the others as I warn them now while absent as I did present in my second visit that if I come again, I will not be lenient. So Paul is kind of like leaning on this courtroom language here and he's saying that if you have accusations against me, 
then they have to be come with the proof of witnesses. It, it, remind, it reminds you of Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.19. He says, Do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. So he's just letting him know. He said, Look, if you have problems, then we'll entertain that if you have witnesses. Because he knew that he had done nothing wrong to them at all. And uh, he, he, was, he was very confident in that. Uh, so let's let's go on then and read these. I want to take some more time in these next verses, three, four, five, and six. Uh, in verse three, it says, "You desire proof that Christ is speaking in me. He is not weak in dealing with you, but powerful in you. For he was crucified in weakness, but lives in the power of God. For we are weak." in him and but in dealing with you we will live with him in the power of God so he says in verse 5 he says examine yourselves and see if you are living uh, whether you're living in the faith test yourselves do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test I hope you will find out that we have not failed. Okay, so in in verse three, he he addresses that apparently some of them were saying, "Well, how do we know then if if you say that these super apostles that come in aren't speaking uh, for Christ? How how can you prove that you're speaking if Christ is speaking through you, Paul?" Is basically how they're approaching him, and. Um, he goes through, and in verse 4, he's just talking about, look, we may come across as weak because we come as servants, and we come working hard, not taking your money, and that might appear to be weak to you, but we come living in the power of God, and you're going to see that. One way or the other, you will see that. And so he really then, in verse 5 and 6, he flips, he flips it on them. He flips that question back on them. You want to see if Christ is in me? Hey, I want to know if Christ is really in you. He throws it back at them. He says, uh, examine yourselves. Uh, uh, he explained, uh, reluctantly he explained in the last chapter how God really did uh, live through him and, and how that uh, he experienced that heavenly uh, heavenly experience uh, in the last chapter and if you did, missed uh, last week's study in chapter 12 he he talks about how he was called up into the third heaven uh, the third heaven which is basically like the courtyards of heaven itself in the presence of God he was called up there he said I don't know if it's in the body if it was out of the body I don't even know I know what was seen and, uh, and he, he goes on, he talks on enough to where he finally admits that it's him that was there. And uh, so, so he reluctantly told them that because he felt forced into that. But here's, here's the deal. He says, I want to know if Christ is really in you. I want you to challenge yourself, examine yourself, he says. You know, prove your Christian faith. He goes on. He says, "Don't you know? Don't you don't you realize that Jesus Christ is in you?" He says, "Don't basically don't you know for certain that God is in you? That the Spirit of God is in you?" Because Paul writing the Roman letter in in uh, Romans eight sixteen, he, he says that that the Spirit of God testifies with the believer's spirit that they are children of God. And he's saying, I want you to examine yourselves. Are you who you say you are? Uh, because if they are who they say they are, you need to remember that. Remember that because if God is living in and through you, your behavior is going to, to be a godly behavior. It's, it's going to be... It's gonna be uh, you know, the Spirit of God dwelling in people. 
remember what the fruit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control so he's saying uh, that's in Galatians 5 22 and 23 so so the unquenched or ungrieved spirit of God in believers manifests himself in, in these good behaviors and uh, but yet with these Corinthians as it's unfortunate <clears throat> excuse me it's unfortunate that many believers today just like these Corinthians uh, act in un ungodly ways and then when they're confronted about it we are quick to say well it's that person's fault and actually that's not true it's not someone else's fault how we respond and how we behave and so let's let's, let's move on you know but but he, he just says to him, test yourself examine yourself are you is God has God and is God transforming you to into these godly fruit that's seen in your life if not repent when you need to repent okay verse 7 it says uh, let me just read it here uh, we pray to God that you um, that you will not do what is wrong by refusing our correction I hope we won't need to demonstrate our authority when we arrive. Do the right thing before we come, even if that makes it look like we have failed to demonstrate our authority. For we cannot oppose the truth, but must always stand for the truth. We are glad to seem weak if it helps show that you are actually strong. We pray that you will become mature. I am writing this to you before before I come hoping that I won't need to deal severely with you when I do come for I want to use the authority of the Lord that they has given me to strengthen you but not to tear you down so these verses as I was saying at the opening how do these verses you know what do we pull what are the principles that we pull from these verses to the church today and I think we can pull some things especially how leadership how pastors how leaders Christian leaders act towards people in the church uh, Christian leaders uh, demonstrate and, and should always demonstrate uh, deep love for the believers uh, the and, and live in, in the, the before them the hopes of we never want to be a burden to to people in the congregation but we want to to be there to build up it it, it shows uh we should pull from this that that there is a on on the christian leader that there is a dedication to the welfare of the people in which they serve uh always seeking to build them up and encouraging them not to uh not to have to tear them down uh, in in using their authority in that way. That, that shouldn't that that that's not the desire of a pastor of a Christian leader to use authority in in a way that has to 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 tear someone down. That's that's high and lofty. Uh, put put themselves in a lofty position that they shouldn't have. That, that's not what a Christian leader wants to do. A, a Christian leader wants to build uh, a believer up to maturity, to, to equip and to, to help and to encourage. And, and a Christian leader should always want to protect the good news of Jesus Christ. You know, adoption into the family of God by the believers uh, has to see itself uh, in love, acts of love and kindness and truthfulness and goodness. And, and that's what a, a pastor, a Christian leader, wants to stand for in the, uh, in the body of Christ. And, and so when you see those things, wow, be encouraged that, that you have someone that is uh, walking with God and uh, 
has your best interest at heart. That that's a that's a good good thing. And so uh, let's let's hope that that uh, your pastors uh, are that way. That that I am that way. That that uh, none of us are perfect, but but that we always strive to be building up and encouraging and standing for the truth and and, and loving, and uh, that's the goal. I know that's my goal, and and that's uh, Pastor Josh. That's his goal, and and we do uh, love you very much. Listen, to just this last verse here. Or the last verse I'm going to look at tonight, verse 11. It, it basically kicks off the uh, the closing remarks, uh, the benediction, if you will, of the letter. He says, "Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you." Paul is bringing, he, he brings this difficult letter to a conclusion uh, with, with, with friendship, with hope for the future. He, you know, he, said, he calls them brothers and sisters, reminding them of their close unity in the family of God. And, and he, he, knowing that, there, that, that their relationship has been stressed, because of the uh, division among themselves, uh, their their di division, divisiveness, the way they acted towards Paul, and and how that affected their relationship with God Himself, uh, things uh, that they sh instead of of being divisive, they should look at their their relationship with one another, and they should really be rejoicing at all that God. Uh, has done in their midst. And so, he says, put things in order. Or another way of saying that, uh, some translation says, uh, make things complete. Or aim for perfection is a good way to translate this. There, there's a serious need for the full restoration between them and God because they had act, some had acted sinfully uh, between one another because of the actions that had taken place they were divided amongst themselves and so they can't live in peace and unity uh, like that and so they need to be reconciled with God with one another and ultimately you know Paul's prayer is that they'll be reconciled with him and so uh, put things in order he says he goes on he says listen to my appeal you know, he's like, I'm warning you. I strongly encourage one another. You know, he's saying, be encouraged. Be comforted by one another's push to do the right thing. Uh, and he says, agree with one another. It literally means to think the same thing. Uh, have the same thought as you serve the Lord. Uh, like where Paul writes to the Philippians. He says in Philippians 2, he says, you know, I'm encouraging you to, to think, to live, to agree wholeheartedly with one another. He's, and he goes on, he says, don't, don't look out for your own interests, but look out for the interests of others. You know, putting others even above yourself. And he goes on, he says, I want you to have the same attitude as Jesus had. You know, he comes as a servant. Uh, uh, he gave up his rights as God, left the throne of heaven, come to live among us, and, and actually died as a criminal. And God raised him to life. So that's what he's talking about in Philippians 2. And he's saying the same thing. He says, agree with one another. You know, the same, same there as Philippians 2. Agree wholeheartedly. So, so he wants them to be at peace with one another. At peace with God. At peace with Him. And then he, he, he ends it, he says, And the God of love and peace, the God of love and peace will be with you. Um, Paul usually ends 
his, his benediction or his closing remarks with the, the God of peace be with you. And he adds here in this letter the God of love and peace. And it speaks loudly to, to, to what they need. They need the love of, of Christ dwelling within them uh, so they won't be so, so obstinate with one another and with Him. They, 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 the love and peace enables them to address the change that needs to happen in their hearts and in their lives and in their attitudes. And so He knows that if they do this before He is there, that that third visit will be a great, great success. Listen one more time. Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful, grow in maturity, encourage each other, live in harmony or in love and peace. Then the God of love and peace will be with you. May we be people that, pray, first of all, pray, pray for your pastors that we are those pastors to you that we want to be and that God's Word asks us to be. And be willing to examine your own selves. Is, is the love of Christ coming through you in, your, in the congregation? And, and maybe some people are watching uh, this uh, midweek study and, and you're in other congregations. But ask yourself that. Examine yourself. It, it's, it's scriptural. Examine and test yourself, he said. Make sure that Christ is living in, in and through you. That the Spirit of God, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, uh, and self-control. Make sure that those things are welling up in and overflowing out of your life. It should be for each of us as we grow and mature in our spiritual walk. And these are good things to take from this uh, letter, uh, this, the letter that we know as 2 Corinthians. And so I hope, again, it's been helpful. God bless you guys. Uh, it's been a fun ride for me, you know, doing a little extra study on this and, and hopefully bringing it to you in a, a good way. And um, may we all benefit from, from the hearing and a application of God's Word to our own lives. So bless you guys. I pray that God will bless you and keep you. Make His face shine upon you uh, as you walk with Him each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.